This is a cool pulpit. It uh, it cranks, <laughs> moves up and down. Um, Pamela and I are a little different height. Really appreciated that message in worship. Just before beginning, just want to say what a privilege it is. I do esteem it a, a privilege and a joy to have been invited here. Uh, a surprise indeed, but um, I give God thanks for those things that come our way that we are not expecting. I am entrusting that which I seek to offer on myself today to you and to God's Spirit. I do not take your presence here or your attention for granted. I believe that there's something amidst that might be found to be generative of what could be possible if we give ourselves to God's imagination and to God's prompting. I seek to be a servant of that prompting today. Let us pray. Gifting God, surround us with a posture and a disposition of vulnerability. Kindle within us a humility that seeks to accept and to receive and to act on that which your spirit kindles. Use these words and the preparation that I have undertaken and somehow metabolize them into something worthy not only of our attention, but of that which will inure to your glory. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. I want to dedicate this presentation actually to Robert. On my early morning devotional walk this morning, I was walking around troubled. Certain things in my own congregation and family and around the world caused me not to have the best sleep last night. And so I woke early and I was out walking. And I came upon Robert. Robert is unhoused and living on the street and stopped and talked with him. Listen to something of his story, his estrangement from his family the rough time that he's having on the streets of Toronto, his concern about the oncoming cold, and where will he stay? And I shared with him where I was from, Ottawa, and he originally was from Ottawa. I told him what I was doing here in Toronto. I found that pretty interesting. He wished me well. We exchanged a sacred moment, and it caused me to remember the why behind that which I want to speak and why we have gathered. And so I thank Robert, and I thank God for bringing us together this morning. Some of you might remember back in 1988, the Winter Olympics that occurred where? Woohoo! Calgary, that's right. Now, it was interesting for a number of reasons. I remember that particular Olympics because there was something significant about it. Some of you might remember that there was the entry of a certain bobsled team from a very unlikely place. <laughs> the Jamaican bobsled team was uh, a hit at that Olympics, indeed. And some of you know I spent six years in Jamaica and, and actually went to the, to, when I was there, went to the site where they were actually practiced with go-karts on the street in order to learn how to do this. But there was another less well-known story and a narrative that found its way coursing through that Olympics and actually led to a change in Olympic policy. Some of you might remember a certain individual by the name of Eddie the Eagle Edwards. Eddie the Eagle Edwards was a British jumper, ski jumper, who was a plasterer by profession and had very little training, very little expertise. He really wasn't very good. He was known for this bright canary yellow suit that he had, coke size glasses, thick glasses, and he just did not look like an athlete. In fact, when he came over, the airline had lost some of his equipment and luggage. People had to lend him some. 
And then when he went for his event, the security guards wouldn't let him in. They took one look at him and said, he can't be an athlete. Who is this imposter until they had to call for officials and verify his credentials? Now in the competition, Eddie the Eagle didn't do very well. He finished second to last. That may sound kind of good, but the last place finisher was disqualified. <laughs> now what happened to Eddie is that he became a kind of instant hero. He was looked down upon, he was uh, by the majority made fun of by some of the commentators, but he became a hero, this sort of anti-hero, a popular person. In fact, when he got back to England, he was celebrated and he even got an invitation to be on Johnny Carson. But the Olympic Committee did not like this at all. This was not good for their understanding of what made for elite athletic competition. And so they actually enacted a new law, a new rule, as it were, saying that it was called the Eddie Rule, which requires all athletes to, have to finish in the top half of the international sports event as a prerequisite for getting into the Olympics. You see, it's okay to have losers in their mind because you need winners. But if losers get too much attention, that's not good. It was seen as detracting from the elegance and the eliteness of the competition. You see, losers are supposed to disappear and get off stage quietly. I think of that story when I think about the genesis of the Christian movement, and I think about that which Jesus exemplified and embodied. You see, the Christian, Christian movement changed the world for the better in many, many ways, though truthfully not always so, but we'll come back to that. And in so very many ways, the early followers of Jesus and their subsequent spiritual de descendants took the preaching, teaching, example, and exhortation of Jesus very seriously, and thank God they did. It was the preaching and testimony, exhortation, sacrifice, and modeling that evoked and nourished and sustain maneuvers of transformation in the human community. Here's an example. When we read the opening lines of the United States of America's Declaration of Independence, intoning that, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, some may be tempted to think that this is self-evident. It affirms the Creator that persons have rights because of their inherent worth, that all are included, and society is called upon to uphold these. This is the statement, this is the implication. But there's nothing self-evident about this, is there? Ancient Middle Eastern and Mediterranean and European philosophy and culture did not attest to these supposed self-evident truths. Homer did not write that Zeus or Apollo or Pan esteemed all human beings equally. In Greek philosophy, Aristotle did not believe all people are equal. In fact, he believed that women were defective by nature. He believed that inequality, masters and slaves, was the natural order of things. He wrote, for that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjection and others for rule. In contrast, the sum and import of Jesus' teachings lifts up the endowed value of humans. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? So don't be afraid. You are more, worth more than sparrows. How much more valuable are persons than a sheep? And this was particularly the case in terms of how Jesus treated children, how Jesus welcomed them, how Jesus used them as examples in the proper sense. Don't prevent children from coming to me, for to such belong the kingdom of God. 
And he placed a child in their midst, and he said, whoever welcomes one of these welcomes me, and not only me, but the one who sent me. Now today, we, those resonate with us, and they sound very happy on our ears, as it were, but that was not the reality of how children were regarded or treated in the days of Jesus. G.K. Chesterton points out that in the so-called pagan world as such, they would not have understood any such thing as a serious suggestion that a child is higher or holier than an adult. It would have seemed like a suggestion that a tadpole is higher than a frog. You see, Jesus' over-the-top regard and treatment and elevation of the status of children in a context where they were widely regarded as disposable was significant. In the status-ordered world in which Jesus inhibited, children were on the bottom rung of the ladder. Many babies in the ancient world just did not survive. Unwanted children were left to die, as were most babies who were blemished, malformed, or disabled in any way. They were simply left outside at a designated place, usually a dung heap, in a practice that was called exposure. The head of the household had the right to decide who could live or die with impunity. One archaeological dig found a gruesome discovery of bones of nearly a hundred little baby skeletons seemingly murdered or thrown into the sewer. It was the followers of Jesus who mostly rescued the babies and children from the dung heap. A few others did, but usually they rescued the children in order to turn them into slaves. This Jesus movement created an alternative community for children. In fact, in the second century, that document that we know as the Didache, a kind of Christian instruction formation manual for followers of Jesus, it strictly prohibited the practices of exposure, infanticide, and abortion. This is because as the shepherd of Hermes states, all babies are glorious before God. Now, was it self-evident to the Roman and Greek culture that all human beings are created equal, children are not? No, it was not. This was a radical departure from the zeitgeist of the day. There's more. The context in which the Christian movement emerged was a contestable one. And what I want to spend time today is talking about the role of preaching in helping to form and to provoke such contestability in the way of Jesus. According to Nicholas Westerhoff, Jesus' understanding of the downtrodden expanded on the Hebrew understanding, which had talked about the need to protect widows and orphans and aliens and poor and so forth, those excluded from participation in society. But Jesus expanded that to talk about those who were seen as outside of the care, not only of the society, but also that the coming of God's just reign required that they be lifted up. They were excluded from full participation. Sociologist Rodney Stark argued that one of the primary reasons for the spread of the Jesus movement was the way that the followers responded to the sick. The question that I am asking underneath all of these is what role did preaching, did the proclamation of the word play in the formation of a new identity, in a radical departure from that which was? I want to share with you a writing by Justin Martyr in AD 160 that helps to catalyze this and illustrate it. He wrote, we who hated and destroyed one another, and on account of their different manners, would not live with men of a different tribe. Now, since the coming of Christ, live familiarly with them and pray for our enemies, and endeavor to persuade those who hate us unjustly to live comfortably to the good precepts of Christ, to the end that they may become partakers with us in the same joyful hope from God the ruler of all. There's something about the intrusion of Christ into that context, into the reality of the assumptive world of that time 
that cause people to give their lives and their community and their investment to something different. There was transformation. We who used to hate people and not get along with them because they were different, they were of different tribes. Now, since the coming of Christ, what does that mean? The coming of Christ involved not only preaching, but enacting a new vision of what could be and a charge and a commandment to live in a particular way with that radical love. And it is because of that that this transformation took place. It was not evolutionary. It was radical departure from what was. Another example, during the reign of Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius, there was an epidemic of what is believed to be smallpox. This happened a number of times. And it's interesting to hear the commentary when you dig back into the memoirs of that time to hear what actually happened. There was no injunction, no invitation at those times from the writings of Homer or the Greek god Zeus to care for dying people. One of the historians, Thucydides, he wrote, they died with no one to look after them. Indeed, there were many houses in which the inhabitants perished through lack of an inten intention for care. The bodies of the dying were heaped up one on top of the other. No fear of God or law or man had a restraining influence. The same thing happened in Rome, the onset of disease. They push sufferers out. But you see, in those days, there was a community of those formed by the imagination and the impetus and the call of God through Jesus that remembered they followed someone who would touch lepers and go to the sick, who understood something about their destiny wrapped up with the way in which they cared for the most vulnerable. They remembered this and they lived accordingly. Diocenes, the third century bishop of Alexandria, he wrote about the actions of the Christians, this community formed by the preaching, teaching an example of Jesus in this way. Heedless of the danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them departed this life serenely happy, for they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. What kind of people do this? And what provokes them to do it? What could seize an imagination of transformation in such a way that they radically depart from the assumptions of the world in which they live, not only the assumptions but the philosophy and the philosophical undergirding from both Roman and Greek philosophers and thought. There was a callousness towards people of a certain disposition. That was the reigning ideology. Something entered into that that transformed them. This talk is entitled, I Know Your Deeds, and some of you, as astute as you all are, I can see it on your faces, would recognize indeed that that comes from Revelation. You know, Revelation, that book that mainline churches don't like to flirt with at all. I want to suggest, however, that there's theological, ecclesial, and homiletical sustenance to be derived from such engagement. Earlier this year, in April, I co-led a group of uh, 18 persons to Turkey in April, and it was my second visit there, and among some of the sites that we visited were the archaeological sites of the remains of the seven churches that are addressed in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. Ephesus is the most well-preserved. The others are almost virtually gone. Smyrna is the only one where there's still a continuous church there, but the others were interesting. It was instructive, actually, to see the physical locations, again, to be reminded of the context of the letters. You know, given the order in which they are beginning with Ephesus as they move around, they actually form a, a, a circular movement that demonstrated perhaps this was a Roman postal route, so it made it easy for the letters to get around. But what we observe that there are specific concerns in each, church, each of the churches that are addressed, faith and faithfulness, or lack thereof, and the churches that with which the plurally rendered Christ is most concerned. And so I want to talk a little bit about what we may learn in our zeitgeist, in our present reality, the wilderness that Pamela was talking about in which we find ourselves. What might the situation of those seven churches have to say to us today? about our life together, about our preaching, about our formation, about our testimony. 
The letters, firstly, are addressed to the angel of the church. You know, the Ephesus angel, the Smyrna angel, the Pergamum angel, the Charlie's angel. Uh, uh, oops, I just wanted to see if you're falling asleep or not. But, because if you were, I'd have to um, indeed pray that you would be touched by an angel. Only some of you got that one, did you? Anyway, the angel may be construed to be the representative personality of that church. You know, you think about your congregations, and it has a certain character, a certain personality, a certain life that is coalesced maybe in an image or what it is known for, as it were. So the angel is addressed to speak into the entire congregation, as it were. The Christ also, who is varyingly rendered as the one who has a sharp edge, a double-edged sword, or the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, or the Amen, has special intimate knowledge of all the goings-on in the churches. This is sobering, because it's still true today. See, the living Christ has intimate knowledge of what's going on in our congregations. And here's how the risen Christ addressed the different churches. Let's look at the kind of affirmation as well as the correction. So the Ephesus church, they're firm for being hardworking, persevering, committed to faithful teaching, rejecting false practices, but they are reprimanded and corrected for having fallen away from the passion that they loved at first and the need to repent and practice the former things. The church in Smyrna have bravely withstood afflictions and poverty and persecutions, They have nothing to correct from the living Christ. Pergamum remained faithful and brave and tenacious in their faith in the shadow of Satan's throne. That's a reference. This is where we see the actual reality of those places being taken seriously. When we went there, it's still present to this day. There is a a sort of temple and a throne to Zeus, and it was referred to as Satan's throne. But they're called to repent for tolerance of false teaching and heresy. Thyatira, they are commended for their love and their perseverance and service and increase. They're called to repent and oppose the immorality that is practiced there. Sardis, there's no affirmation given, but they're called to repent of their apathy and a false sense of security. Philadelphia, even in light of limited strength, they have been faithful to the word and the name of Christ and the power of their mission is to continue and will continue. There's no correction offered to them. Laodicea, no affirmation given, but they're challenged and called to repent of falsely trusting in their wealth instead of committing to faithful living and testimony. So the question that I ask, that I've never heard asked by any commentator or any exposition on these churches is, what was the role of preaching in contributing to the culture of those congregations to their faithfulness or lack of faithfulness? What was the role of testimony and the spiritual practice that engendered a particular way of being and leaning into their context wherever they were? These churches were located in different contexts, but the larger context of the Roman world was upon them. How is it that they differingly engage with their context? What was behind that? I offer this pondering. What role did the preaching play? Let's look at the specific context of this, and this I found interesting on our, our tour there. Take, for example, Ephesus. Ephesus was known as the first of Asia, major hub of commerce of both land and sea, filled with diverse peoples and philosophies, deity cults. The most prominent, as you know, was the worship of Diana, Artemis. The temptation was to compromise and practice all the various religions and philosophies together. Just lump them all together. Does that sound familiar? There are people in our context that want to take a little bit from everywhere, like some cafeteria of options. It's nothing new to some extent. We are very much in our present reality in a mode that is similar to some of what we observe in that first century church. We see a similar issue of accommodation in Thyatira. In the midst of their growth in faith and service and love, they're contending with a strong female leader that they nicknamed Jezebel, who has persuasive power to lead people away into covenant infidelity and idolatry. So they're wrestling indeed with faithfulness. And then there's Sardis. This one was particularly interesting. 
Sometimes we're not able to make sense of the references unless we know the archaeology and the history of the particular church. So Sardis, when we arrived there, our guide mentioned to us and told us that it was built, the original city, on an Acropolis. And that Acropolis could only be accessed from the southern side. The other three sides fell over a deep cliff, 1,500 feet deep. And so the reference to the fact that be aware lest we come like a thief in the night is to their history. It's a reference to the history. On two occasions, Sardis was overtaken because intrepid, stealthy, skillful soldiers actually climbed that 1,500 feet in sufficient number as to secure the city gate and open it up for the intruding army to come in. On two occasions, they didn't learn. They forgot to protect that which they assumed was already safe. They were not vigilant. A question might be asked, what is it that the living Christ says to our congregation? What affirmation, what correction? What observation about the way in which we're living in our societal and neighborhood context that we are faithful in engaging or unfaithful in engaging? What role is the preaching playing in forming an imagination and an impetus for engagement? Spiritual practices that will fund and support and orient the way in which we reach out and live out the gospel. Many have done this already, but I think it's worth remembering that taking our context seriously is one of the urgent tasks. And I want to spend some time locating indeed some of the challenges of our preaching because of where we find ourselves. And some of you certainly would already know this, but it bears repeating. Remember in Matthew 16, 3, Jesus calls on his disciples to discern the signs of the times, the spirit of the age, as it were. In other words, the, the zeitgeist, if you will, to plumb the zeitgeist, the spirit ethic, broadly conceived in which we live and in which the Christian faith. What is really going on? Many commentators have been talking about this, about what we're really finding in our society, the secularity and so forth. And it's happened even earlier in our century. Soren Kierkegaard, he wrote, the Christianity of Christendom takes away from Christianity the, the offense, the paradox, and instead of that introduces probability, the plainly comprehensible. That is, it transforms Christianity into something entirely different from what it is in the New Testament, yea, into exactly the opposite. Jacques Ellul, in his book, The Subversion of Christianity, he sets out to wrestle with the following. How has it come about that the development of Christianity and the church has given birth to a society, a civilization, a culture that are completely opposite to what we read in the Bible, to what is indisputably the text of the law, the prophets, Jesus, and Paul. There's not just deviation, but radical and essential contradiction and real subversion. Even Martin Luther King Jr. in his letter from the Birmingham jail, he wrote about the church he observed in the, in the throes of the civil rights movement, the dominant church, the respectable church. He says, the contemporary church is often a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. It is often the art supporter of the status quo, far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is consoled by the church's silent and often vocal sanction of the things as they are. Wow. But that was then, that's not now, is it? <laughs> One of the most incisive expositions of our reality, I think, is found in a book that some of you may have read, and if you have, you need a certificate of accomplishment. Charles Taylor's Secular Age, 900 pages and dense, dense reading. But if you can stay with it, engage it, because it is profoundly insightful. It's not 
complete. As long as it is, it still misses uh, certain things. There are assumptions about, um, for instance, the Roman, Roman Catholic dominant imagery in terms of understanding Christendom and so forth. Doesn't account sufficiently, I think, for some of the reforming movements. But be that as it may, I highly recommend it because it is incisive. And, you know, how do you summarize 900 pages? But I want to point out some important points. He talks about social imaginary. And the social imaginary has to do with the assumptive, the collective assumptive world, as it were, of a particular given time and place. And he talks about the social imaginary of the church in the Middle Ages and before the Reformation was that this is all there is. Transcendence, hope, transformation, and openness, a porous, he talked about the porous self, that the self was malleable, that the self was subject indeed to the powers that be, to spiritual powers and engaging with those powers. The sacralization of the world and seeing it that way says that what has happened now is that there's a different social imaginary. It's what he calls that we are born into the, an imminent frame. And what he means by that is that there is now a preoccupation, a predilection for seeing this is all there is. There is no mystery, as it were. And whether or not we want to admit it and we, we contend against it with our faith and so forth, it's saying this is the, the sea, the waters in which we swim the secular dominant view where it is not only that many people no longer believe in God or believe in anything transcendent, they don't even feel there's a need to. Can you relate to that? So this new social imaginary offers new possibilities and offers a requirement that we engage with what has brought this about, but also why it is there and the how. It creates a space that is contestable. What is necessary, as we were hearing last night, is that we tell a better story. The imminent, this worldly concern and the goals in the foreseeable future, this is what there is. This is all there is. And yet, even as we recognize that, we know that there is in this imminent frame whispers and rumors of another world. Some of you might remember Julian Barnes's uh, novel, Nothing to be Frightened of, his book, An Atheist. But he begins the book with the line, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. It's emblematic of some of the discordance and the ambivalence around what does it mean to live in this imminent frame? Theodore Dalrymple, a British writer, he confesses it's not as easy as one might suppose to rid oneself of the notion of God. And he goes on to say, few of us, especially as we grow older, are entirely comfortable with the idea that life is full of sound and fury but signifies nothing. However much the philosophers tell us that it is illogical to fear death and that at worst it is only the process of dying that we should fear, people still fear death as much as ever. In like fashion, however many times philosophers say that it is up to us ourselves and no one else to find meaning of life, we continue to long for a transcendent purpose. To tell us that we should not feel this longing is a bit like telling someone at the first flush of love that the object of his affections is not worthy of them. The heart hath its reasons that the reason knows not of. And the reality is although this is what we are born into, and what Leonard was saying, that the next 22nd generation is a part of this is their reality. You and I know and believe that because we're made in the image of God, there is a disposition of inquiry beyond ourselves, beyond that which is. No matter how much the cosmologists and the scientists and others tell us that this is all there is, it is observable, we create our own reality out of the power of our mind and our brain. There's nothing outside except that which we create. 
No matter how much that is pounded into the zeitgeist, there is this defiant disposition, orientation in the human soul that when given a chance, is inclined for the something more. And that is where we, as a community of faith, in our preaching and in our testimony, are to come alive and to offer an alternative story. It is not so much, as P.T. Forthight said, it's not so much telling people what they should do. It's inviting people to trust someone who loves them inestimably. Our souls respond to love. A more recent book, some of you may have picked it up already, it just came out about a month ago, the latest offering by Diana Butler Bass called Grounded. If you haven't picked it up, I recommend. You know that she's a leading commentator on religion, politics, and culture, and she's followed up that book, Christianity After Religion, makes wonderful observations about the culture, about the church, the state of the church, and the movement that has taken place and so forth. I commend it to you. But in this book, Grounded, she is contesting yet again the, re the, the reticence to let go of this notion of a distant conventional God in the church as much as we talk about this distant. For instance, in her chapter on, on sky, she invites us to ponder God in the heavens, but not, not sort of uh, as a distant thing, but in the sunset. Not sentimental spirituality, but as an opportunity to speak deeply into the heart of our common humanity. She's seeking to invite us to remember that we are grounded and that what people are experiencing now in the society is a spirituality that is found in the world, in the dirt, in the water, in the cosmos. They're grounded. She writes, spirituality about personal experience, the deep realization that dirt is good, water is holy, and the sky holds wonder that we are part of a great web of life. Our home is in God, and our moral life is intertwined with that of our neighbor. But none of this is for the sake of feeling good, individual prosperity, or guaranteeing a blessed afterlife. It is about tracing the threads of the interconnected universe and finding God in nature and in community, and in finding God, discovering that we are really one. Grounded. She says, the spiritual revolution is a protest movement against the forms of religion that have lost the binding vision of peace, wisdom, and equanimity here on earth. It is a critique. The last quote I want to offer, she says, when I think of the far-off qualities of God, I no longer think up. Instead, I consider God beyond the horizon, just beyond the place where the sky meets the ground. And the Spirit calls our gaze outward to lift our eyes to the edge. The spiritual revolution is the shift from the vertical God to God with us. Dirt and water are understandable and tangible, icons of earthly sacredness. But we need the sky to remind, remind us that no matter how close God is, God is still the one who hovers at the horizon. Understands that there is an appetite now to recognize that there is an interwovenness to life and that people not going into hallowed halls and buildings like these, but they are discovering God because, as I said before, although the imminent frame, this secularity, this notion that this is all there is, there are people who are discovering in their gardening, in their experience of water, in the creation ethics, they're discovering that this whisper, this rumor of another world has been found in a God who is calling their spirits forth. How is our preaching helping to facilitate this without requiring certain hoops, as it were, that people come and fill our anxiety-ridden congregations? How do we extend this hospitality, this witness in the world? Another offering and commentary comes from Barbara Brown Taylor in her latest book. Many of you have read it or heard of it, Learning to Walk in the Dark particularly drawn to this and because of what she does in terms of that metaphor that is found certainly within our scriptures but also our language. The way in which dark shadow is always referred to or often referred to pejoratively. 
Light is good, dark is bad. Not only does that have uh, spiritual significance, but it also has racial significance and how it is easily arrogated to particular peoples. But what she talks about is her, her re, not rejection so much, but the, the, the displacing of the privileging of what she calls solar spirituality for lunar spirituality. In other words, she talks about recovering the subversive and the counter-testimony of Scripture that affirms darkness. How, how is it that Abraham, invited by God to look up on the sky and to count the stars, how is Abraham able to do that? Because of darkness. All of us begin in the darkness of our mother's womb. God talks about offering unto Israel the treasures of the darkness. The shadowed back of God is what Moses experiences, the shadow that he's shrouded in. There is this counter-testimony even within Scripture that talks about the giftedness of darkness. And so whenever we talk about light and dark and dark being bad, we are betraying a thread of testimony in Scripture that affirms that. I'll give a, an example. About eight years ago, I went on sabbatical. I was rest, restless in terms of my calling, identity, and leadership, and I, I wanted to really experience something about the fresh ways in which church is being imagined. And so I spent time in preparation reading about the emerging church and new monastic movement and so forth, and I decided reading is good, but going and visiting is better. And so I made arrangements to travel around North America, living in community with various new monastic um, intentional Christian communities. One of them was in Seattle. Some of you may have heard of the Church of the Apostles. Karen Ward is the abbess there. Has an alternative kind of um, church. It's a, it's a, uh, a merger of the, um, uh, an experiment, as it were, of the Lutheran and the Episcopal Church. And one of the things that struck me was not only the innovative ways in which she is intertwined with the community and the art community and bearing witness in coffee shops and so forth, it is that the imagination, this is some years ago, but the imagination of that congregation was about who, who is missing, who's not here, and who is nobody in the whole city of Seattle dealing with. That's where they started. And you know who they discovered? The goth community. Do any of you know what I mean by the goth community? They tend to wear black, they're sort of anti-establishment and, uh, and so forth. And so Karen and a few members from the church decided, okay, nobody is ministering to this community. We're going to go to them. So she went and spent weeks, maybe into some months, hanging out where they hang out at a certain place downtown, either skateboarding or music or different kinds of things, and just what she called loitering with intent, just listening, talking to them, understanding where they're coming from. And by the time I had reached this, this was done before I got there, by the time they reached they had now been established a service. They called it Sanctorum on the third Sunday evening of the month. And in her contact with this community, understanding what their concerns were, what they were preoccupied with, she invited them to come and shaped a worship experience around those concerns. So the black that they wore and this kind of shadowed life in which they live, she metabolized that in a sense in a liturgy, a 16th century liturgy that she found that celebrates the gifting of darkness. And they come with their chains and boots and black garb and so forth, and they sit and kneel in adoration and light candles and chant and are ministered to with the gospel that starts where they are and leads them somewhere. It is preaching and testimony that begins to take the local reality of that church context seriously and draws people because it connects with that primal spiritual yearning.
The other thing that I want to mention that is often not remembered in our context and preoccupation with this context is the notion and the reality of global Christianity. Some of you may be familiar with Philip Jenkins, his work, The Next Christendom and the New Faces of Christianity. And what he's talking about is that the growth, while North America and Europe, Christianity is shrinking in the global South, Asia, South America, and Africa, it's burgeoning. That's where the life, the vitality is taking place. They're not concerned so much with shrinking churches. They're concerned with how many can they enable and train so that they can keep up with the demand of the exploding church. What's going on there? Now, it's interesting that the hermeneutical and scholarly preoccupation of the Western church sometimes looks askance, as it were, looks down on this particular, because they tend to engage with the scriptures in what some in the Western would say a non-critical view. They're not as concerned about the scholarship and all of those things. What they're concerned about is the correspondence with their lived reality the poverty and the violence and the racial tensions and the terrorism and all of those things. They live in multi-faith relationships all the time. They're concerned with how are they going to see and faithfully appropriate the message of the gospel in that context. And you know what? Guess what? They find a lot of correspondence because the context in which Jesus preached was one of poverty and oppression and corruption. Just as they're facing, they said, this speaks to us. This is what is going to enliven our imagination. A Bible verse that is particularly important for them is John 10.10. 10. I am come that you may have life and life, abundant life. And that abundant life is comprehensive. It's not abundant life like we spiritualize it. It's abundant life because they need to find something to eat. They're not sufficient doctors and hospitals, and so they need a gospel. They need a word. They need a testimony that is going to help their sick. And as Fifa Sem Sempangi, who's a Ugandan theologian who had to flee uh, because of Idi Amin, he wrote, a religion is true if it works if it meets all the needs of the people. A religion that only speaks to the soul and not the body is not true. Africans make no distinction between the spiritual and the physical. If the gospel you are preaching does not speak to human needs, it is useless. It cannot compete with the witch doctor and the gods. And so they find in Jesus' words and in the descriptions of the parables and the stories that the, the people pray, they pray and they lay hands on people and they're healed. You know, talk about, you know, yes, we, 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 we use those in our liturgy and we ask that, but, you know, we're sophisticated. We, we don't really expect that to happen. But they do. When I lived in Kenya, it was interesting, the, the raw contribution of people's lives and the generous giving over to the imagination and the assumptive world of the gospel text. I should believe it. Foolish? No. There is something about the impetus of their passion and enthusiasm to transform people's lives and others, to pray for the sick, to pray earnestly for the sick, to hold prayer meetings, to anoint them, and to expect that there would be healing because they didn't have enough money to take them to the hospital. I wonder if some of our preaching has caused us to be distant from the immediacy of Scripture and God's Spirit. I wonder. And so, don't worry, I'm coming to the end. I ask us, now what? I know your deeds. I know your deeds. And so the questions I'm asking, in what ways was the preaching of each of the congregations in Revelation, in each of our congregations, in what ways were they contributing to or impacting the trajectories of faithfulness as well as that which is condemnable? We may not like to go there, but what is condemnable in the way we are practicing the faith? What critique from the risen Christ is saying, you need to get away from that? But also, what is being commended 
What is it that we are doing that is bringing life and hope and imagination and justice and an insertion in the world that is like salt and yeast? Take an inventory. Dieter Hessel in his book, Social Ministry, he says this has to do with, with wor our worship and our preaching life. Liturgy, worship, either domesticates or liberates. There is no middle ground. Domesticating liturgy justifies the way things are. It encourages people to acquiesce to the dominant social norms. A liberating liturgy, on the other hand, empowers groups of believers to comprehend the sufferings of God and to develop alternative prophetic praxis. The emphases and the trajectory of our preaching and our worship life together is going to form our people in a particular way. If our churches are the way they are, we have to inquire about the nature and the emphases and the commitment in preaching and worship. Is it transformative or is it domesticating? Is it just reconfirming what we've always done? That is the axis on which turns, I believe, the way forward. Preaching is an essential expression and collaborator of the liturgy, hence it would be necessary and necessary to be participating intimately in either domestication or in liberation. Walter Brueggemann, he talks about preaching, preaching that will nurture, nourish, and evoke a consciousness and a perception alternative to the consciousness and perception of the dominant culture around us. What kind of alternativity are we engendering by our preaching? Hispanic activist Cesar Chavez once said, we ask for the church's presence with us, beside us, Christ among us. We ask for the church to sacrifice with the people for social change, for justice, and, or in love of neighbor. We don't ask for words, we ask for deeds. We don't ask for paternalism, we ask for servanthood. In what ways is our preaching and our spiritual practices engendering servanthood? This might be a helpful moment to pause then and take stock as we wind this up. Let's bring it home. What kind of letter, let me ask a series of questions, what kind of letter is a risen Christ sending to our respective congregations? So when you finish here, check your email or your mailbox and see what's arrived from Jesus for your congregation. What of our deeds and our life and our witness do we hear Christ affirming? What's Christ affirming about what we've been doing, what we've been saying, how we've been come, how we've been treating each other, how we've been leaning into the world and the community? What's Christ saying? What's Christ affirming? What do we hear being corrected, critiqued, condemned. What do we hear in the way of promises to our communities of faith, remembering that we too find our ultimate identities in Christ, we too are the Lord's? For remember when the risen Christ speaks to the churches in Revelation, he speaks to them as one who is in their midst and one who affirms that they belong to him. Never forget that. No matter how lost we may feel that we are, the affirmation is we belong to God. We belong to Christ. Our unfaithfulness is not going to get us out of jail and pass go. Christ is going to pursue us. Pursue us. Because we are Christ. In the end, I want to end with this. This sense of knowing about deeds, knowing our deeds is a two-way street, and it's the other side of the street that makes all the difference. Psalm 77. Psalm 77, I commend to you. It's a psalm in which lament is metabolized into memory and faith and confidence. Hear the psalmist. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out my untire untiring hands, and I would not be comforted. I remembered you, God, and I groaned, and I meditated, and my spirit grew faint. 
You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I, I thought about the former days and the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night and my heart meditated and my spirit asked, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has God in anger withheld God's compassion? And then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. And get this, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Your ways, O oh God, are holy. Oh, what God is as great as our God. You see, that phrase, I know your deeds, is a two-way street. God knows our deeds as a congregation, as preachers, as witness. But the hope and the salvation, dare I say, is that we are invited to know God's deeds. God is relentless in God's commitment to our flourishing. God loves us. God heals us. God's deeds are filled with accompaniment. God's deeds are filled with justice and forgiveness and empowerment. And yes, correction, but also affirmation. And God's deeds, God's deeds are filled with compassion and commendation. Amen.